So hello everybody, uh, welcome to this session E in uh, entrepreneurship about entrepreneurship in quantum technologies. Um, about 70 years ago, um, the first semiconductor based amplifier uh, was publicly presented at Bell Labs and that turned out to be a massive technology breakthrough. With quantum-based technologies, uh, it could be that we are experiencing, uh, experiencing a similar shift in technologies. Now, for that kind of shift to happen, of course, you need on one side to understand the technology uh, behind that, but you also need people uh, to make that happen. And this is exactly what this session is about. Uh, it's not much about the technology, what we have heard about in the morning and in the afternoon but this is more to about the people actually making it, that happen. Now you need two kinds of people. You need on one side, excellent researchers. Uh, we have heard about them uh, most of the day, but you also need another kind of people and the kind, another spirit, which is this entrepreneurship spirit. And this is what we are going to discuss now uh, with two person, uh, what it takes to be an entrepreneur in quantum technology. So we will do that with uh, this discussion with two person. On one side, we have Jan Götz from IQM in Finland, which is one of these person currently transitioning or who did already the transition from research to entrepreneurship. And then you need another kind of person in this ecosystem. And uh, these are other people around uh, helping this transition to happen. And for that, we invited Jordi Montserrat from Venture Lab, a Swiss company, helping and supporting entrepreneurs to do these first steps in entrepreneurship. My name is uh, Francesco Kinsley. I am from the company U Research in Switzerland, and I will be moderating this session. But before we start, uh, let's go through a couple of technicalities. Um, so we will uh, you have at the bottom of the screen a Q&A button and please post continuously your question there because they will well collect the questions uh, during the whole session and then we will answer them at the end of the talk. So we will first have Jan presenting his view and then Jordi presenting his view on entrepreneurship and then we'll gather your questions and ask pose your questions to both uh, persons. Good. So then let's, without further ado, let's move to the first speaker. So let's go to Jan Gutt. So Jan um, is the CEO and co-founder of this IQM company, a spin-off from Alto University in Finland. <coughs> he did his PhD uh, in superconducting quantum circuits at the Te Technical University of München. And then he continued as a, with a postdoc in Helsinki at Alto University in uh, experimental physics uh, at the Institute for Low Temperature. And now he will share for the next about 20 minutes, will share with us his experience of morphing from a brilliant quantum physicist researchers into an entrepreneur. Jan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Francesco. Um, if you want to see my face, someone has to allow me to turn on my camera. Otherwise, I will um, do it like this. Oh, now it should work. OK, here I am. Hello, everyone. Um, and thanks for this uh, very nice um, introduction. Um, let me share my screen first so we get started. OK, I hope everyone can see this now. Um, yeah, so um, I'm actually very honored and happy to be here today and um, talk about entrepreneurship in quantum technologies, um, something that I haven't done um, for all my life, but actually I made a transition from a scientific career um, into the startup world. And, and this is something I want to tell you today, how this worked out um, and what were the main points. So I will um, basically cover three topics. I will talk a little bit about my personal story. So what actually were the drivers uh, for me um, personally? And then I will talk a little bit about startups um, 
um, as such um, and, and what do you need to start something and start a deep tech um, company. And then finally, I will tell a little bit about IQM and, and what we are doing and how this all fits together. Okay, so let's start um, a little bit with, with myself um, and my transition from science to entrepreneurship. Uh, so on this picture, actually, um, it looks um, maybe um, quite easy that you're just sitting there and throwing things around. Um, and on the other hand, it also looks like a little bit of fun. Um, and I think the fun for sure, it, it always is, and, and I think it will also be, but of course, it's not only always easy and, and there are also some, some hard tasks that need to be done if you really want to start a company and run the company. Um, and it's a lot of hard work, but I think the fun usually dominates and, and because we have so much fun um, during the work, um, I think um, it all pays back. So I think also thanks to this great team that we have um, in, in IQM, um, it really pays back all the working hours that you put um, into this. So my life basically started in Western Germany um, and I, I studied physics in Munich at the Technical University of Munich, um, which um, many people may know Munich uh, mainly um, because of the Oktoberfest, um, which is a nice event, which actually should have happened now, right now during these weeks, but it, it's not taking place. And also this is something that I actually enjoyed a lot um, as a student um, being in Munich and, and participating in these uh, nice events. Um, also, I was during my student time working actually for, for two other companies to, to get some um, independency um, as well. Um, and the, the study itself, it, it didn't take place in Munich downtown, um, but actually um, in a research campus north um, of Munich, which you see here, um, the picture. Um, so on the top picture, you see the research reactor, um, which is in, in Munich. And on the top, uh, on the bottom picture, um, you see the, the research campus. Um, and in yellow, you see the institute, the Walter Meissner Institute for Low Temperature Physics, um, where I was um, graduating. In the background, on the top of the photograph, you see, for example, the Allianz Arena, which is the stadium where Bayern Munich plays. So this is what you had to pass as a student every day, going from downtown um, to the research campus. Um, I decided then to um, stay at the Walter Meissner Institute and, and do a PhD there um, in experimental physics. So I'm a hardware person. Um, this means I, I was working in the clean room, as you see on the top left picture, um, fabricating superconducting um, chips. Um, and I was um, setting up a lab as well, which you see on the top uh, on the bottom left picture. So um, I was actually spending a lot of time in the lab building a cryostat, um, where nowadays we are very happy um, to, to buy them from companies like Blue Force, for example. Um, this is something that I still had to do on my own um, during the PhD. Um, I was also very lucky and, and my boss allowed me to have a dog actually during my PhD. So you see it there is a puppy on the top right. Um, and then um, she was growing doing my, my PhD and always watching uh, me in the office. So it was a, it was a fun time um, doing PhD um, in Munich and, and this kind of convinced me that academia as a whole actually is a great thing and I decided um, to pursue an academic career. Um, and do a postdoc in, in Finland. So I decided to, to move to Northern Europe, um, to the Helsinki um, area, uh, where I was working as a postdoc in QCD labs um, with uh, Mikko Mettinen, who is the professor there. Um, and I basically stayed in the same field. So it was also superconducting circuits, fabrication, where we got a lot of help from the Finnish Research Center VTT. Um, and I actually, I was lucky um, that, that this whole activity was financed by a Marie Curie Fellowship, uh, which um, allowed me to participate in many, many interesting events. Um, one of them, maybe the highlight, was participating in the Lindo Nobel Laureate meetings, where I gave a session on quantum technologies um, together with um, David Weinland and, and Sersha Roche. So this was really interesting times um, as a postdoc um, in Helsinki. And, um, I enjoyed it so much that I, I kind of uh, made the transition into this entrepreneurship staying in Helsinki, um, which um, means that I still um, 
kind of kept the connections to um, the academic world. So on the top left, you see me actually giving a lecture at Aalto University, um, which hopefully I will also do again in the future, maybe next semester, um, I, I will give also some courses on quantum technologies. But actually it means also that you talk much more in events like this, um, where, where it's not so scientific driven anymore, but it's also about the technology, about the commercial aspects and, and the industry. And, and this is something, of course, as a scientist, you don't have so much. And, and these are skills you have to learn somehow on the fly. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And, and basically, every day you learn something new. Um, as you know, quantum technologies is also uh, a strategic and political topic. So I'm actually quite involved in, in um, a few activities on European level. So you see me on the top right in a circle. I think this is in Luxembourg where we are discussing some things about European tech um, related to quantum. And in the center on the top, you see me talking to some, some commissioner in, in Brussels. So this is kind of the transition um, that, that you have to make um, going away from the science and having a more broad scope, more broader view on things, uh, which also makes it very, very interesting actually to work um, in entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. Um, so this is the kind of transition that, that I made. Um, if, if people ask me, I would definitely do it again. It's a lot of fun. Um, as I said, new things to learn um, every day. Um, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to also see now um, the company grow that we are building here um, in Helsinki. Um, so what does it take actually to build a startup and, and to spin something out of academia? Um, this is what, what many pe people are, are asking me, well, how did it happen for you and, and which were the most important things? Um, so I think what it usually takes is you need to have some kind of a dream and a vision. What, what do you actually want to achieve? Um, and, and this vision and this dream um, was a lot um, also communicated by Miko Merton and the professor I was working for um, in our labs at Alto um, in the Micronova green, um, building. So he always had the dream of building a really large scale quantum computer. And um, he has been distributing this fascination among all of his students and, and I was one of them. So I was actually very happy to work with Miko um, in the labs and now still having him as, as one of the founders. Um, but of course, it's not only having a dream, but then also at some point you need to act and you need to um, do something and, and, for example, start a company first on paper and, and then also fill it with life. Um, and, and this is something that we did. Um, and um, in the beginning, actually, it was a lot of work um, just planning um, things. So discussing how, how could the company look like, how would it evolve, how much money do we need, and all of these things. So it was really kind of bringing the dream out of your head on, on paper, so to say, and, and checking does it all uh, make sense. Um, and it's, of course, the, the dream is one thing, but you need also the substance behind it. And this is, I think, something that um, we have here in the Helsinki ecosystem. There's a lot of substance on the, on the technology side. So on this slide, you just see a little bit the history and, and the most important steps um, that, um, that are relevant for um, creating a, a hardware startup in particular. So IQM is building hardware for superconducting quantum computers, um, where of course you need a little bit more infrastructure than if you are a software startup. Um, and, and this infrastructure is exactly um, what we are having here, um, which is really world leading and which makes our life much easier. So for superconducting um, quantum computers, usually you need two things. You need low temperatures to operate the systems and, and you need some production or fabrication line to um, build the um, chipsets. And, and both of those um, we have here um, in Helsinki. Um, so we have the low temperature labs, which were established already in the 60s, um, which is a quite successful um, group of, um, of research, uh, scientific research groups, um, and maybe one of the most prominent um, outcomes of the low temperature labs is, is Blue Force, which nowadays I think is one of the most prominent players in providing the cryogenic technology. So this helps us a lot having this cryogenic background here and all the expertise in this field. Um, and the other part is the Micronova Clean Room 
room that you have already seen on some other slide. So this is actually um, the biggest clean room in the Nordic countries. And the nice thing here for us is that it's open also for companies. So our engineers can go into the clean room and use all the machines and all the processes. Um, and and uh, we kind of pay by hour um, there, which makes it very cost efficient for us actually to produce um, the quantum chips. And we don't have to buy all the machines up front, um, which from an investment perspective was very important actually um, to get it done. So this is kind of the infrastructure, the technology that you need, but then of course you need also the people. Um, and um, I already mentioned Mikko's name um, as a professor. Um, he actually, uh, he met already in 2001, um, Juha, um, and, and they worked on their PhD together. Um, and then Juha left actually the academic field and was working for around 13 years in, in software industry. Um, and Miko stayed in academia and he was founding um, in 2007 um, the QCD lab. So this is his research group. Um, and in 2009, um, Miko was working with Kuan um, in Sydney, back then still on spin qubits, so a slightly different technology, but he convinced Kuan to come um, to Helsinki and then they worked for many, many years um, together here on superconducting technology. Um, and I joined in 2017 as a postdoc in, in Miko's lab. So um, this is kind of the people aspect, but of course then finally also you need some kind of innovative approach. And just as one example, I, I put here in 2016, the patent on a, on a tool that we call QCR. Um, and, and this is just an example, but in general, it's, it's very helpful if you have some kind of IP portfolio that you can use to commercialize um, the technology. So this combination of infrastructure, technology, ideas to make things better, but then also having a, a great starting team actually um, is very important. Um, and um, finally, what happened is that the four persons that you see here, um, they became the four founders of, of IQM. And having this long um, tradition on working together and building the trust between the four of us, I think this is another thing that's very important. Um, because as I said, it's not only um, always easy going, but sometimes you really have to also make tough decisions. And, and this usually um, is um, easier if you know each other uh, quite well. So the setup was quite attractive actually for, for investors um, and we were able to convince um, a group of investors to make a seed investment in IQM in 2019. Um, it was actually the biggest um, investment in the uh, seed investment in the history of Finland, 11 and a half million euros. Um, and, and we built up then some momentum and dynamics and we were very happy in the beginning of 2020 to also um, get um, Enrico Solano on board. Um, so he joined us um, and he is now leading um, our activities in Germany and he's leading um, the office in Munich. Um, and um, I think this is another aspect um, which is very important on, on the entrepreneurial side is that you can generate followers um, because this shows actually that people trust in your story if they are willing to jump on the train and this these are very important steps in, in the lifetime of a of an early stage startup okay but what does it actually mean and what do you need behind the scenes and and which are the bits and pieces um, i put this here in just two three categories um, you need as i said this dream the visionary ideas and the solutions but then also to make it a startup you need some kind of a business case um, because no investor will invest in you just for the case of supporting a dream and then once you have the investors you need to be able to start and grow actually your business um, and in our case, um, the solutions and the technology, they come really from fundamental research. So there are decades of research here in, in superconducting technology, which is very important. But then you need also enabling technology. So you need to bring it to the next level out of the university labs. And here we are very happy, for example, to work with the Finnish State Research Center, VTT, which is operating, for example, the Micronova clean room. Um, and you need also funding schemes beyond the, the private money. Um, so for the private investors, actually it's very important if they see that there's also public um, support. So this can be either governmental support here from the Finnish government or the German government, but also then the European Commission actually plays a very important role in funding these um, deep tech um, activities. And then you need someone to work, of course, in, in the company and, and you need the best talents, especially in quantum technologies where talents um, are quite scarce. And here we were actually very happy to get all these well-educated people out of Alto University who were working from us uh, for us in, in the very beginning. So we were quite happy to have around 20 people starting um, for IQM in the very beginning. And with this, we could generate really some momentum to get started. 
Um, the business case, of course, the tricky thing is how to commercialize deep tech and technology, which still needs a few years um, to be sold. Um, and here it really helps if you have also some ecosystem that, that supports you and that helps you bring the technology um, to a professional level. I just put here two names. CSC is the supercomputing center here in Finland, and then Blue Force, which really helps us um, in, in a way of taking care that um, all the cryogenic um, works. You need then um, the private money, so some, some venture capital. We have here in Finland something like Business Finland. And then, of course, you need to the willingness to get out of academia and into the entrepreneurship um, world, which, of course, not each scientist um, is, is willing to do this. And then once, once you have all of this, you, you need to work on your product. So for quantum computers, that means build a system that works, which is not trivial, of course. And it helps if you can generate partnerships to do this, to distribute a little bit the tasks. Um, and then you need a way to find revenue streams um, where, where we put a lot of work actually in, in, in convincing here, for example, governments to invest into quantum computers and buy quantum computers for their large research system. And, and if you have all of this, you can start growing your team, which is one of the biggest assets. Um, so in Finland, this works very well. We have a very um, active ecosystem, um, players from hardware, from software, from universities, and from research centers. Um, and this is actually also acknowledged worldwide. Um, this is just a slide from Helsinki Business Hub, um, where there's a quote from, from Jake Tyler, who was assistant director um, for the White House, who was here visiting us. And, and he was giving this uh, quote that Helsinki is a hotspot for quantum technologies. And, and this is really something that we feel that this we are seeing worldwide, meanwhile, actually as a very active field and uh, active place in, in quantum technologies. Okay, since I have not so much time left, I will just briefly cover the IQM story. So what we do is we build quantum computers. Um, so superconducting um, technology um, and um, we build the systems with the motivation to install it on premise in, in research centers and, and large national um, research labs. So this is actually the goal, getting it out of our lab, which you see here on the left side and make a real uh, um, industrial product out of it that you can place in a big computing center, um, for example. Um, we, um, are actually, um, I think in, in Europe, one of the largest um, hardware teams. Um, we are very strongly backed from financial investors, but meanwhile also from um, governmental support. Um, and, and we really were able to get very um, high class profile people on board. If you look at the, the team, how it was evolving, um, we are now more than 60 people actually in two places, Helsinki and, and Munich, and still growing um, in two places. Um, we, we have our own labs, we are using the, the Micronova fabrication um, and um, we are building quantum computers in a slightly different way than maybe you see from, from other um, big corporates and kind of our um, secret sauce here is that we are developing the application specific processors and the idea here is to, um, to save hardware resources um, and, and in this way um, make useful um, calculations with a um, smaller number of qubits. I can skip these um, to, to come to an end, um, just to give you an understanding of, of how do we actually commercialize the technology. So at the moment, we are in this first phase where we are really um, in, the, in the phase of selling research quantum computers, um, and at the same time de developing the technology um, to be able to solve business problem. And, and, and selling these, these research quantum computers actually means also a lot of lobbying work. So this is my last slide. Um, just to, to tell you that it's, it's um, not only about tech, not only about science, it's also a little bit about politics. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite active in, in lobbying to different governments worldwide, trying to convince them to invest into quantum computing. So thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, we are always hiring. So if you're interested in quantum computing, um, just give us a note. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. I think we have, we have about more than 70 people in the room. Uh, I guess a lot of them are going to reach out to you because it's very exciting to see how successful you are in this venture. So now we turn to the other side of the stage uh, and we welcome Jordi Montserrat. So Jordi uh, is the co-founder and managing partner at Venture Lab. Uh, this is a Swiss company supporting Swiss uh, Research, so Swiss entrepreneurs to do their first step uh, when they turn, want to turn ideas into business. 
and into world-class ventures. Uh, Venture Lab supported tens of, of such young entrepreneurs in different areas of uh, science and technology. And uh, they will, Jolly will give us uh, his, uh, his view on this entrepreneurial journey, uh, which is uh, that Jan just described from, from his side. So Jolly, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and the floor is yours. Currently, I'm still muted. Uh, so here we go. Thank you very much, Francesco. It was a great pleasure listening to Jan. And uh, uh, maybe first, congrats. I'm always uh, congratulating entrepreneurs for, uh, for their amazing uh, uh, job and uh, what it takes to build such a company. Um, let me maybe just come on the screen uh, now with, uh, with my presentation. I hope you can see the presentation and uh, my, the, 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 I'm welcoming all the people here, the, the 70 people in the room. Um, I had the pleasure to quickly look at the list, so there are a few names which I'm familiar with, so a big hi to all the people whom I already had the pleasure to work with. Also, so Quantum Entrepreneur Day, my questions here was entrepreneurship in quantum technologies. It was really the question, and uh, I will be addressing this from a perspective for those who don't know me. I am uh, the co-founder and the managing partner of Venture Lab. We are a uh, uh, 15 plus uh, years organization uh, here in Switzerland, private one company uh, whose mission is to build programs and support entrepreneurs uh, in deep tech uh, to develop their companies. I'll come back a little bit later, but I think that um, above all, uh, I have been working. So for the past 15 years, I'm an entrepreneur myself, investor as well. And um, I've been working the past 15 years in taking people out of the lab uh, and supporting them, building their company across a whole series of programs. And what I like to start, and therefore I like kicking into the high gear, is I always say actually a big part of my job is to help the entrepreneurs to simply take the first step. And uh, when I listened to Jan, he mentioned he came out, some people do it natural, some but many, many people have on their desk, uh, or at least in, in their mind, this question, should I take the step? Should I make it happen? And what will it take? And therefore, a lot of it is in the mindset. I, I strongly uh, believe and have now this experience that uh, what we need to do is to really take the kick, you know, and we are here for this. Uh, we are here because what we want is to be sometimes a little bit hard, but especially supportive to be sure that you're going to go the entrepreneurial way. And we know that most of you, many of the people with your talent, those who are in these fields, uh, we're talking the PhD, the masters, all these people who develop this, uh, have the talent to become several different uh, um, profiles and can choose a career. So actually, why should you push towards entrepreneurship is maybe the first question. And why should you take this step to say, let's go and build that career? I always compare this with, uh, you know, the Michael Jordan choice. He could have become uh, and he became the greatest uh, player in the world in, in basketball, at least one of them. He could have been, many people say, a baseball player. And for me, I know that you can become researchers. You can become, you know, great people in great companies. Uh, but now is the question, so why would you go? And I'm taking this from actually another entrepreneur who gave it to me. And this presentation, I have reached out to some entrepreneurs to tell me, I uh, share a few things with me that, um, that are, are important out there. Uh, and this one I really liked because it was uh, in maybe a bit of a provocative, but yet uh, a very uh, a nice way to say, hey, you have the choice to choose a career. And there are definitely things that uh, you will find uh, in the startup, in the entrepreneurial career that uh, you might not find elsewhere. And vice versa, by the way, you know, entrepreneurship is not for everyone. And I am never saying everyone should become, but I think that everyone that has maybe the taste to go for it, I want to give them the chance. And that's the idea is to invite the people to say, hey, take your chance because there is really a reward on, uh, on to be taken when you are taking this career. And particularly, you know, I think, and uh, that's really one thing, it's the exposure. It's really the, the pleasure that you can get at building your own 
and your own company. I mean, building, bringing your technology and your research into a concrete product, as well as being on the forefront of decision of what you are doing. I think uh, when I when I look at the stories and I see typically Jan uh, lobbying around Europe, I mean, as CEO of a company, you have this chance to be able to accomplish this thing. It is very large, but still you are meeting some of the most interesting people. There are then many other motivation we hear around uh, maybe you know doing your own thing money i don't know several people are motivated by different things but definitely it's something that um, you can look at being on the forefront building your own it's not for those who want to really do the research and research only those who want to have nice hotels maybe not either uh, but definitely taking this step now, going there is why is it for me so important is that because we talk a lot about innovation and particularly in the field where you are, you know, research, quantum, but at the heart of innovation, you find the entrepreneur. And this is for me really essential. Innovation does not happen without people and therefore so important that uh, as many of you as possible uh, get the chance and take the step to jump into that career. Uh, that's the ambition that uh, we have or at least the tools that uh, we want to propose. Yet looking at the entrepreneurs and looking at this first key, can we trigger the right people to get there? Uh, and to develop. Now, I often look, of course, at the ana at anatomy, where many ask what does uh, an entrepreneur look like? Uh, if you look into, you know, the guts and what he needs from knowledge to passion to skills. Um, and here, one important thing is, uh, of course, when you look at this, you think, whoa, that might be uh, the Superman-like uh, approach. Uh, it's not so much about Superman, but also building a team. You look for other people, it was mentioned, uh, the super people are not never alone. It's super teams who really make it and therefore look for a complementary, you know, passion, knowledge, perseverance, and the ability to surround yourself being one of the essential part of, uh, of uh, building the startup adventure. Another thing that is absolutely key when I work with entrepreneurs is um, at some point you bring what I call the entrepreneur's promise, you know, so it's uh, as entrepreneurs, you, you bring the famous vision that you see probably better than others where the puck is going. Uh, you sell to us where this can lead, where this research, remember many people uh, uh, don't have the faculty even particularly in deep tech and when it comes to quantum science, to see what is feasible, what is not, and how you will execute this into practice. So the entrepreneur's promise, and that's what we expect from the entrepreneur is building this message of knowing where the puck is going so that you can go ahead of anyone and then you can convince ahead of anyone people to invest in this sector, uh, which was well described. It's not only investors, it is customers, it is in other areas, and that's what the entrepreneurial spirit has to be brought. Once you have the entrepreneur spirit, it starts with an entrepreneur and then it is a process. And that's where you can get a lot of help. It's very difficult to, I would say there is a long debate, you know, do you have it or don't you have it? Um, I don't enter into this debate. I don't know if it's really relevant. I think it's important whether if you want to try or not. And if you want to try, then there are the tools to enter into the process that is the life cycle entrepreneur, uh, um, the, the life cycle of the entrepreneur, which will relay around a series of questions of how do you enter into a positive spin of what should be at the heart, which is you are going to build a product or a service to offer to your customers, but until you get there, and particularly in fields like quantum into deep tech, well, you will need some support and some financing. So you do have to create the necessary vision, you know, in order to advance this uh, uh, view or this product and customer to have the necessary resource, which allows you to, of course, the resource to build and advance from prototype all the way to product, and then eventually get to the famous sales. And all of this has to be in a constant balance to know what is your next priority, how can you get there, and what kind of support you can get. And it is this feeling that uh, you know you have this plane that you have to support, and as you're flying it, because you're advancing your company, you are building it. 
And so an expression you will hear very often is flying the plane as you're building it. I always remember, uh, so when I tell this to entrepreneurs, I tell them, but it is perfectly feasible as long as you don't try to change all the pieces at once. Don't try to change the wings and the engine, you know, right at once. Just know where to focus your effort at some point and build this focus as you're moving forward. Now, for it, People in the science, very strong background in science and engineers, and just as a small uh, disclaimer, I'm myself uh, an engineer actually from EPFL, got my master, you know, so I sort of understand the feeling having started my career in IT in development and, you know, being an engineer, I sometimes say there is a little bit of things that we need to almost unlearn and become at ease with. And I call it this uncomfort of engineers and scientists. You know, it's the ambiguity domain. How are you going to move towards this actually core challenge, which is the selling, selling, selling? Because when you become an entrepreneur, you sell. Don't take sell as only sales to customer. It's selling, selling, which is communicating, communicating. It is pitching, pitching. It is bringing your vision across. And then there are thin limits, which engineers are very often scientists less at ease maybe than other profiles with, which is, you know, what is a vision versus are you selling hallucinations? Uh, what is a promise versus uh, are you selling bullshit? What is an assumption versus this is hot air? And this is interesting. A lot of it, when you're in the mindset and that I want to work with the people is making this transition from being you as a group and dealing just with the ambiguity of making and preparing. And that's where there is already a lot of tools which you can use, preparing in training, preparing in financing, that you can prepare in order to finally really sense who will be in there and get to this moment, which is the founding, the founders, the people who create that point in the company and are able to surround yourself. So at the start, it's really identifying the people who want to get, and here it's the invitation to all of you, who want to get into this, uh, this uh, field and then are able to develop, develop the spirit of executing around this. Uh, uh, addressing the points, you know, where's the vision versus the hallucination, the promise or the bullshit, the hot air, is the more you have to build something, is the more sometimes it's difficult to really pass this barrier and articulate it the proper way. I sometimes often uh, uh, also have a little bit this uh, question which I find and maybe that's something which uh, you know sometimes when entrepreneurs have a hard time putting this on the table I try to compare it to the work that even in science you do when you are exposing you know a theory and then you are convincing to put million in order to try to prove through the experiments that this should be working in science while well, somehow entrepreneurs are doing the same thing. So get at ease with it and take the step in order to go and build your company. How do you get support? That's a big question. And here I will try uh, I'll share a few of the tools that we have built in Ventrilab. But by extension, I think that, uh, and I will come to a few other examples which are given later. There are several tools that today you can use. We saw the example of Jan in Finland. I think today all countries, uh, Switzerland as well, has a very dense ecosystem of uh, initiatives that, they, that you can use connected to international programs, European programs, where you can get a lot of support. Um, we built several programs, uh, maybe uh, a few of them, which uh, are of use, particularly when you are at the early stage and you want to take this step to start your, your company. The first one is uh, Venture Kick. We've been investing over 30 million in the past uh, um, 12 years, where we it's more than 700 projects which have been supported across the board, including several uh, quantum and, uh, and uh, engineers, uh, science uh, companies. I mean, we work ex almost uh, exclusively or in the majority of cases with uh, spin-offs which are issued from the universities, from the, the is, uh, technical institutes, so institutes of technology. ETA GPF in Switzerland. And uh, with this, we offer up to 150,000 Swiss francs just to really kick, and this money goes to the entrepreneur. It is not something that goes to the university. It's really to help kickstart, come out of the lab, and test the business part of your value of your project. Um, it's something that has been mentioned, but that we emphasize a lot is you have to very early 
think about what will be the business that I want to address. It sounds easy to say, it is a hard work to do. Uh, it is something which I call the necessary versus the sufficient condition to have a product is a necessary condition to have a science, you have to build it, you know, to have technology. Without a product, we will agree, without something to sell, nothing will happen in your company, but it is insufficient to be successful. So what are the sufficient conditions that you need to get together in order to increase your chances of success on the long term? And a lot of it goes through a stress testing, addressing early on the business and the industry that you will want to enter and how and what do you have to learn about that industry. That's what we do in Venture Kick. It is complemented with training. Training is an important part. You have, uh, we, are re we are running a, a national training program. There are many entrepreneurship training programs also directly in the universities, which are here to help you uh, develop your first uh, knowledge, your first skills to really get the basis of how do you go about uh, creating, developing your business case, your company, and then growing your company, which are also great opportunity to connect and network in the ecosystem. I think that that's one thing that is absolutely key. It's done also with VentureKick. It's three stages. So every time you pitch and you get feedback, but particularly you also connect, connect to the industry, connect to the experts, which is very dense. And here you can have it. Venture Leaders brings you to the next step. This is International Roadshow. We have one which is Technology Silicon Valley. This is benchmarking, I call it. It's like you get in there and you take and you go to pitch to some of the best investors on the planet directly in Silicon Valley. So you get direct exposure, direct feedback forces you to get to the next level. And then a few other tools which are coming here, but the most important is wherever you start, just pick one of these things to get into the network. Those programs, those initiatives, those networks are well connected and you can usually leverage them. To illustrate this, I took a few and maybe they will come a little bit uh, redundant with what uh, Jan was, was mentioning. And uh, I asked a few of our uh, entrepreneurs who've been in the programs uh, uh, in the past to share with me a few words of wisdom. Some of them I think might even be in the room. Um, so I will reuse what they send me to illustrate a few of the key points that you should be really thinking of. Uh, starting with the words of, uh, of the founder of uh, Konami, uh, uh, Konami uh, Matthew Munch. And of course, he was nice enough. He's a Venture Kick alumni to say, start with Venture Kick. Thank you very much uh, for saying this, Matthew. In any case, I was, uh, of course, happy. But he has several other very relevant points, I would say, that he really have to look. And the first one, which I really like, is forget the technical challenge for a minute. You will have to fix it. And you clearly the one that uh, is here. He says it's the easier to solve for the researcher. I'm not saying it's super easy, but I'm saying this one is the easiest that you know how to address. Now, focus on the rest, and I added necessary versus essential, I mentioned this. The second is rapidly get external advice, you know, and you're not looking for approval, you're looking for feedback for the things you don't know, and this is very good. The goal here is not that you seek approval in the sense of, yes, people are with you, many people might not understand, but what you're looking is to uncover all the fields, knowledge of things that you don't know, and that you have to address. I call it laying out the foundation in Venture Kick when we usually are at our first step, we put 10K on the table. I know we don't build a company with 10K, of course, but with this 10K, I want to have a map of what the business case will be and the challenges on your table and that you put all the placeholders that you will have to fill in order to build a successful company. Of course, you have to assemble talent. The team is a recurring topic. Uh, you don't assemble the team of friends of other researchers from friends in the lab. I'm not saying you have to exclude them. I'm saying be careful. It's not about friendship. It is about building a team of talent that will help you. And then, of course, just build the culture you want. It's your company. That's your privilege. And you will have to address companies. And here comes the time, the time dimension. This one will be taken off uh, uh, in, the next in the next entries, but already introduced here. Uh, that are here things that you can really look at in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, thinking of time. It takes a long time. Quantum, you're in a field that is deep science that will take time to convince customers, and this you have to take into account. He gave me as well a few, I asked for a few tools and networks which were specific to quantum. They might have been addressed already during uh, the, the day and uh, I just 
potentially just repeat them. There is the quantum flagship, which is the funding that's your open programs. There is the um, and companies, you have to look at those. Uh, you can connect directly with Matthew or with Jonathan Holm, which are the people who can help you understand what are the sources of money out there. You have the Quantum Industry Consortium, uh, where you can also, uh, I mean, Matthew is uh, another point, again, a, a point of contact. He, I think he offered himself, so I hope, Matthew, uh, you, you will forgive me for telling, go ahead and connect with you. And finally, of course, the Swiss Quantum Hub, uh, uh, which has been built and has a, a long list of resources, uh, uh, which uh, you probably also, of course, Francesco and your research, uh, your research story has this resource at hand that you can look at what is there that you can benefit from. Let me continue with a couple of slides that uh, were shared by, uh, and they're in French, but I will just give you this, uh, the general uh, message, which is uh, the founder of Atolite, Samuel Stonderegger, which uh, many of you might know Atolite, company who has already 10 years of building and that has uh, really had to show on a long perseverance, uh, has read already over 10 million as well. But of course, I also share that, uh, hey, in an industry where you think things are going to grow very fast, it takes, you know, usually sometimes much longer uh, to than expected and it is more expensive than expected. So, go for this with knowing that of course you have to prepare a plan which is let's call it optimistic but knowing that you're in for a potential and sometimes so a long ride a potential long ride and sometimes potentially bumpy now he shares with this because of course if you only look at this you could say whoa why he shares with this as well a few recipes that i really like on how do you get over this because the key question is how do you get over those bumps uh, and what he says around uh, very, uh, in the very difficult time, I mean, sometimes very near uh, to the end of the company, he had several things. And the first one was, of course, the team, but also having early adopters, people who really believed in the technology from the customer side, who already had been helping, investing into the product and are here to help the guidance and support continuously, giving the confidence that it is the right avenue. There is also, again, this culture and this vision that you keep selling. Remember, it's not an hallucination, it's a vision. You might be uh, sometimes, and this is where there is learning, learning to develop a vision that you can really sell and continue to motivate the people. A board that was very supportive, of course, you need people around you and people in your funding that know about what you're doing, which means are familiar with the industry, with the industry environment who know how to manage this on the long uh, term. And finally, a key point, I mean, not finally, but the one more thing he adds is really that, uh, you know, the best source, when you look at funding and you have to go multiple source, the best source is really, uh, uh, going around with the money of the customer and to benefit from the public, the public, uh, uh, all the, the sources uh, that are here. My concluding slide will be the words of wisdom that are coming from another entrepreneur, which story you might have heard uh, uh, from um, as well. It's ID Cantic, uh, founder Grégoire Ribordi, that was one of the big also with an exit uh, who was announced uh, uh, last year. and. Uh, he goes on a couple of points, which I just emphasize here as well again. Remember, they are very risky. It's a long-term program. We mentioned it. So look for early applications. In your plan, look for early applications so that you find things where you can also show, you know, they've done it at ID Quantic and was able to show at the beginning that their technology really works on smaller, I would say, dimensions, or at least on single uh, products, which gave them the big, the time and the resource to develop also on the longer term. Funding has been discussed extensively, mix, go for not only private, but look at all the resource as a supporter, as an investor, and as an entrepreneur, by the way, I run my own company and built companies before, I am always saying, you know, you go to every source that can, you know, support you and what you can get for free, you get for free and the rest you get as much resource as you can in order to move forward. Travel East, I like this point, East is strong, Seems to be a strong appetite. Explore the options. Don't stay home. Europe, US, travel east. Check what there is to be seen there. And of course, bring expertise. So I shall conclude here saying at the end, please look for the impact that you can have as an entrepreneur. 
I mean, you can make a series different with what you have in your hands, with your knowledge, your skills, which are sincerely unique. You know, I mean, not everyone has a chance to get to the level of, uh, of uh, science, technology and network as well in your fields as what you have. So look for impact. Celebrate every step when you're an entrepreneur. Therefore, we put the top 100 forward because we want to celebrate entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs. We look for you. You see here entrepreneurs in a different drones, but that are getting there and, you know, being in the best ones. And finally, take all of this with have fun. It has to be fun and it is, it can be fun even in the hard times. It's a lot of work, but definitely, and we are here to help. So that was, I think, the message of Francesco. I hope I was not too much over time, but I will stop here. If you're ready to kick, we're more than happy to help and happy to answer your questions. Good, thank you very much, Jordi, uh, for this very enthusiastic uh, speech as usual. I knew that when we were inviting you that, that you would be motivating the people here in the room to, to go for in, in that direction, although it's not an easy direction. So now we move, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Thank you for those posting questions in the Q&A uh, panel. We will go uh, through them. Maybe I start with one question, which has been actually posted by somebody here in the room, which is helping in the technics, which is uh, Claudius Rieck. Uh, I will be, maybe a bit, but it's about the team. Uh, maybe I will uh, unformulate it that we can take other questions and I will ask you to be a bit brief. Uh, but maybe to you, Jan, uh, so the team, but maybe what is the most difficult skills to find in your team uh, when you were building up your, the IQM uh, company? Um, well, I think it's not a universal answer. I think you should first look at yourself and what are your skills and, and maybe weak points and then look for people to complement this. Um, and um, being able to, to take people um, who have more knowledge in other um, fields than, than you, I think this is something that is very important and then also trust them and, and listen to them. Um, so I would say having a very um, broad um, field of skills in the founding team, th this helps a lot. And if you don't have it, um, you can also just take advisors or, or think early who would, for example, be in, in the first board that you are going to set up for the company. Um, but then having a deep tech startup, I think the, the focus should be really on the R&D. So get the, the quality um, on, um, on the uh, more research heavy people. So they are, don't, don't sacrifice um, on the quality of your people. I think this is very, very important. Um, and um, yeah, also it's probably a little bit um, then not only what are the skill sets, uh, but um, how do you work together as a team? This is also important. If you just say, okay, there's one big shot and another big shot and I put them together, um, it doesn't mean that it works. It's like in, in soccer, right? If you have only the superstars, maybe it doesn't work so well. So also look at this aspect actually, how will you work together as a team? I think this is very important. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe Jordi, one sentence from your side, what, in your observations of the different companies you've seen, what is the most difficult gap to fill, just shortly? Well, I think Jan said it uh, quite a bit and, and very well. So actually I would like to add a little bit of a difference. For me, the hardest, I mean, what Jan said about putting the team together is definitely correct. And I often refer as a make sure first that uh, amongst the team, particularly the founder, you're brutally honest with each other. And by brutally honest, I don't mean brutal physically. I mean, brutally honest that you really address the hard questions. How do you want to be, you know, uh, together? How, what do you expect? What do you want to build? And do it regularly. But to me, the other point that is actually probably the hardest is that the most successful companies are usually not when you start adding skills, you know, at least at the beginning and that you famously say, oh, I look for the sales guy who will sell my technology. It's how do you transform the people who are there, who have the knowledge, I would say the young who is the PhD, how do we transform those people, help them grow into CEOs and into people who drive company? And this is the real skill. Actually, it's not a skill that I can hire or bring. It's a transformation of the founders into the real key, how they grow into this role. That's what you have to be ready for. And what we measure most of the time is not, are you adding tons of people first, but are you able to grow with your company? And then you can add properly the right people. Finally, okay. if you hire when you get people, we often talked about, yes, get great people. Yes, for me, it's just remember, hire for strength. You know, it's not for lack of weakness. That's something we do very often as engineers. We look like, oh, is there no hole? No, you look for somebody who is better than anyone in one field mm -hmm. where you will really need, and then you can grow with these people. Keeping the right balance, I think that's what I would share. 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, and then the uh, next question is from Manish. Uh, so it's about uncertainty. And what happens actually, because we are, of course, we, we tend to always showcase the, 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 the success, but uh, what happens when the entrepreneurial effort in quantum ecosystem fails? Uh, Jan, have you, have you been maybe through that or have you seen people failing? Uh, yeah. Actually, honestly, I have never thought about this question myself. So maybe this shows you a little bit about the kind of spirit. So usually, I think in this entrepreneurial world, you see solutions and you're aiming for the solutions. And I think there, there's always a solution and people are very supportive. Um, so also on the investor side, um, there's so much support that um, I think also in the case, maybe when the company goes south, that there will be solutions, I'm, I'm sure. I haven't thought about actually what, what happens then. Um, and I think quantum is still so young that um, I'm not aware of, of companies um, who, who have stopped due to some, some trouble or so. Um, but maybe Jordi has more to say. So honestly, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Okay. Uh, so maybe, maybe I, can, I can answer partly, Jan, from a personal and a, and a very broad perspective. So the first thing, if, if the company goes south and I really wish it doesn't happen, nothing will happen except the company might close and might die, you know? And, and the, the key question is, is, is really not whether, you know, if it happens, it happens. The question is not about the death of that company. It will be hard. And, and I went through it just as on a personal note. I went my, my, one of my first company. I mean, uh, actually went bankrupt. So I really know the feeling. We had to over 30 people, bubble, long story short. Uh, the company dies, but you don't die. By the way, entrepreneurs are not killed with their companies. They do rebounds. And the key question is the rebounds. And the rebounds happens in several ways. And actually, I do have this now. I see it uh, as an investor and I see it in Venture Cake. Some of our best entrepreneurs are the ones who come back the second time, sometimes even having failed the first project. So a project fails, it closes, you rebound, you pick up the next projects and you go on. There are a few bullet points, I won't describe them all here, that if this happened, unfortunately happens, and it might happen, actually statistically it does happen, it's okay, you don't die, you just rebound, and there are a few bullet points to apply just to keep a fresh mind in order to go to the next step. And usually, just to conclude with this one sentence, I, 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 and I'm not taking from here, it is a famous sentence in business education. When somebody fails a project, you know, even as an investor, if this was done with a lot of learning, it was done, I would say, seriously. You know, Jan has done an amazing already path and now he fails and he will take probably amazing learning, it might be potentially even more learnings. I'm not saying success, but learnings from a failure that the next time he does a company, I want him to come back to me because you invested so much in the educations and all the learning that you want people back so that you make sure you leverage on all this experience. So failing is here. I'm not saying it's easy. It's statistically potentially there, but just don't worry. What I like to hear is like, hey, you know, don't focus on this. People ask me a lot of this question. I'm like, don't focus on failing first, focus on winning. If you have to, if unfortunately this happens, rebounds will happen. I never seen an entrepreneur disappearing you know because he failed a company they rebound and sometimes back in entrepreneurship hopefully sometimes they decide for their careers happens as well but the learnings by the way of failure will never be something you will regret thank you very much for that jordi uh, now we move I, I have two questions which are more technical so which are more for you uh, jan so one is from uh, katal mahon so hi katal it's a pleasure to have you here Unfortunately, not physically, but I hope next year we will have you physically here. Uh, so the first so his question would be on the application-specific quantum computers you were mentioning during your presentation, Jan. Um, so uh, what specific application problems are you building for? Uh, shortly, maybe, because you have another question for you then. Okay, yeah, so um, basically these are the topics that you typically see in the field where, where we are already very advanced on the algorithmic side. So it's, it's finance, it's chemistry, machine learning, um, where also the companies are very active. So for us, what we need is we need, a, so to say, a product market fit. So if we build an application specific machine, there must be a significant market behind it. So what we do is we talk to the big companies and, and find out what are their bottlenecks problems, and then we go for them. And then another question uh, related to that is from uh, Durga. Durga is asking, uh, what is the typical cost of the system? 
Can you give a number or an estimate? Well, this is a tough question because what we are selling here, so to say, is still it's R and D. Um, so we are we are not selling a fixed product which is ready yet. But if we are going into these research centers and selling to the government, basically it's a five-year project or a three-year mm -hmm. project, and it's very hard to calculate the actual cost. It's more for us. It's a very elegant way of of generating revenue to support our R and D, which we have to do anyways. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, and then I take a question from Vladimir, which is again for you, uh, uh, Jan. So students are, uh, as future professionals, are key for today, uh, are key today for the adoption of the technologies of tomorrow. Uh, how do you evolve them today? Do we have? Yeah, that's actually a good point, and this is very important for us in, in my presentation. I also mentioned this that I'm still teaching, for example, at the university. And actually, what we have also in IQM, we have PhD students, for example, we have a master student. Um, so this is very important for us to take also part of this ec educational task to make sure that the the talents of tomorrow they will have the right skill set. And I think there are nowadays, there's so much support also public from public funding for such educational programs that each, each startup could do this actually. Okay, thank you very much for that. So I think we will close here. Uh, I will take the last few seconds just to thank you all. Thank you very much, Jan, for showcasing uh, your quite impressive progression. And I hope you all the, and I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you very much, Jordi, for your enthusiasm, which you are able to convey even through uh, through Zoom and through webinars. And uh, thank you for the support you're providing to the whole ecosystem. Thank you for the the audience. Uh, I'm happy to see uh, many friends there, which were here in the past, and which will hopefully see again physically uh, in the coming years. Uh, so to conclude, uh, it's a tough journey but it's worth uh, going this, this direction. Uh, be, expose yourself. I think that's the key message of Jordi. Expose yourself early in the journey. Try it, and then you will know if you are the, the, we have the profile for that. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope to, to see you next year again uh, here in Zurich. Have thank a nice you. Day. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.